Coming up, is it finally resolved? Is it time for the hard hats and shovels for a new look KCI? The bi-state business border battle bounces back. Try and say that three times. Also this half hour, could the next Kansas governor be a dog? Why a local Applebee's is now making national news and why this man is dominating our local news? And could the president's plans for a national military parade end up in Missouri? Plus, a changing of the guard, the new faces leading schools on both sides of state line. Week in Review is made possible through the generous support of Dave and Jamie Cummings, Smithfield Foods, Haas and Wilkerson Insurance, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Nick Haynes, and welcome to your weekly 30-minute guide to all the news that matters in this place we call home. Connecting the dots on the news of the week, the senior writer for the Call newspaper, Eric Wesson. From the Fox 4 News morning team, news anchor Mark Alford, the host of Up to Date on KCUR-FM, star columnist and editorial writer Steve Kraske, and political analyst and star editorialist Dave Helling. Last week, while we were tackling the vexing issue of evictions in an hour-long special, Kansas City finally approved a breakthrough deal on KCI. This MOU puts people to work without further delay. That after months of shenanigans, plotting and backroom dealing that had some worried Edgemore was going to be ditched as the company responsible for building and financing a new look KCI and a new firm picked or even more worrisome that the whole process might be forced to start all over again. Who was the biggest winner and who was the biggest loser in that breakthrough deal, Steve Kresge? Well, there's lots of winners here, Nick. Edgemore is a big winner. Mayor James finally has this thing uh, sort of situated. Uh, in the right way, so he comes out looking okay. The city council dodges a huge bullet, Nick, by uh, going with Edgemore instead of reopening this process, which would have invoked the ire of all kinds of Kansas Cityans about how jacked up this process was. Eric, biggest winner, biggest loser in that? Probably Edgemore was the biggest winner, as well as the citizens of Kansas City. I think their voices were heard. I would say, and uh, everybody that's running for mayor, with the exception of Scott Wagner, I think Scott Wagner was probably the biggest loser. Uh, he was definitely on the wrong side of the issue, and he burned a lot of political capital with the release that he had right before the final vote about them being over budget on a project that had nothing to do with Edgemore. How much was that to do with the fact that Scott Wagner, for instance, is one of those running for mayor? Yeah, mayoral politics played a huge role in this. Uh, Jolie Justice, of course, was on the committee that picked Edgemore. So was Jermaine Reed. Both are running for mayor. Scott Wagner, of course. Quentin Lucas, who was a key vote, may run for mayor. Uh, Kevin McManus, another key vote, may run for mayor. So mayoral politics uh, were a key uh, uh, determinant of these votes. But the biggest loser, I think, was Burns and McDonald, oh, who, sure. who worked so hard. In, in, in secret, largely, uh, through labor unions and some other things to try and undermine this vote. And I do think that their reputation, the reputation of that company, has taken a big hit. Did you pick any process. other biggest winners or biggest losers? No, Mark? I do think, I feel bad for Burns McDonald. Here's our hometown team. The mayor makes this deal with them. It's March, almost a year ago, they came out with this big plan. Hey, we're going to do this. We're going to privately fund it where taxpayers won't have to pay one red cent. And then it all goes to hell in a handbasket, basically. And and then the mayor gets out there and publicly scolds Burns and McDonald's for trying to get back in the process through back channels, uh, making Burns and Mac not look too good. Well, that was last week's news, of course. So what happens now? Can we see the shovels coming out, the hard hats with the mayor and other leaders yeah. at the airport ready to dig dig up the ground there for yeah. a groundbreaking? Uh, well, there uh, there are other hurdles to be uh, crossed here. Before I thought we this was the, the end of it. Land. Okay. Well, it's an important step, Nick, and your your viewers should know that because the city could still walk away from Edgemore tomorrow if it wants to for no reason. Just say we're we're tired of seeing your face. We're walking away. But if that happens. Edgemore is going to get millions of dollars in expenses paid, and the city would literally have to start from scratch. Mm -hmm. You can't just turn to AECOM. You'd have to go right. back, request for proposals, do bids. That would put the process back a year, maybe longer. So it was an important step, but you still need an agreement with the airlines. You st still need a final development agreement. You still need a labor agreement with the unions in Kansas City. 
under the best circumstances, we might see demolition begin by the end of this year. I would like there to be a week where we don't talk about the airport because some people have fatigue, Eric. Is this the end of it? No, they've got... This was the major hurdle. They still got some other milestones along the way. But one thing that Dave said, people have had the misconception that if they didn't go with Edge more than AECOM would automatically because they were number two. But the way the RFP was written is my understanding that because they teamed with Burns and Mac or Burns and Mac teamed with them, that eliminated both of them from being the number two and being the and runner And the up signing of that. the MOU. Once the MOU is signed, the procurement process ends and, officially. Right. And that means that if you throw Edgemore over the uh, railing, you'll yes. have to start, start, start all, all over, over again. Yeah. But the timetable to finalize that MOU is isn't until September next. We have yeah. half a year to go before that hurdle gets cleared. The bi-state business border battle bounces back this week. Let me put my teeth back in. It's the <laughs> Metro's largest hospital chain. Now HCA is leaving its headquarters <laughs> off of Holmes Road and I-435 for greener pastures four miles up the road in Overland Park, and they're getting $3 million in tax breaks to cross just over the state line into Kansas. Given how many businesses, though, have now moved from one side of the state line to the other over the last several years to take advantage of incentives, is there anything surprising in this move, Mark? I don't think so, not that it's not going to continue. This border battle has been going on since the Civil War era, and it's not going to end as long as there's money at stake. If Missouri wants the business, if Kansas City wants the business, let's have the best schools, the best roads, the best infrastructure, and the best taxing incentive to keep the businesses here. Since we last talked about this subject on this program, though, Kansas now has a new governor in the name of Jeff Collier. Does he have a different position on this border battle than his predecessor, Sam Brownback? You know, I'm not sure we really know yet, Nick. Uh, Governor Collier hasn't been, we, we hasn't really explained where he is on a whole host of issues. I think what was jarring about this development with HCA, HCA get my teeth back in my mouth, you know, <laughs> is this idea that there seemed to have been a truce in the border war now going back a number of months and things seem to be, have, have settled down a little bit. Suddenly, the border war is back on again. I think that's jarring to people. Listen, there's enough blame on this issue to go around on both sides of the state line in both parties. We simply can't resolve it because politicians still have too much to gain by being able to boast that they lured a business from one side of the state line to the other. And as long as that's the case, this thing's going to go on. And HEA's announcement comes one week after Nordstrom announces it's ditching Oak Park Mall to head over the state line to the Country Club Plaza. Dave Helling, you point out in a column, it's almost forgotten now, but Overland Park spent nearly $10 million dollars to subsidize mm. parking and other improvements to lure Nordstrom to Oak Park Mall in the first place. Are they getting millions more to move 12 miles up the road? No, to the I, I, there's no indication that significant subsidies are involved to get Nordstrom to move. There was a battle for the company 10, 12 years ago when they first came to Oak Park because the plaza did want them to locate there and instead they located in Overland, or at Oak Park in Overland Park as long as the city came up with parking help. Um, and I think they're downsizing going to the plaza, but uh, it is a reflection of the squeeze on retail. And uh, what I try to point out in that column is anyone who thinks Oak Park Mall, which is in essence the last standing enclosed yeah. significant mall in the Kansas City area, if anyone thinks that mall is immune to the pressures on retail, they're not paying attention. And the plaza itself is not immune to those pressures. Either. Because it's always been viewed, Oak Park Mall, as the place, though, Mark, that has not gone into those trends of demise. Right. They've done incredibly well. They've updated it. We've they seen it with stores. Indian Springs Mall, Bannister Mall since I've been here. It's the fate of malls. The only one that's turned it around is Ward Parkway. A guy from Dallas came in and said, hey, let's make it where you can drive up to the stores. That's what shoppers want. Oak Park Mall is going to have this huge vacuum now. What are you going to do with it? They said they're going to reconfigure, reconstruct the mall, maybe a new definition to what a mall is in America. Steve. I just want to underscore one of Dave's points. You know, I think this city at some point needs to begin looking at the idea of what happens to the Country Club Plaza 10 years down the road, 10 year, uh, 20 years down the road. You know, bricks and mortar retail, as we're talking about here, the future of, of that idea is in great jeopardy in this country. What that means for the crown jewel of Kansas City, I think is a little bit up in the air right now. Eric. And, and I agree. Internet purchasing is blowing uh, retail stores out of the water. But one of the things that I, I did notice is you not only have the Oak Park Mall, but you've got Independence Mall. Independence Mall, the people file bankruptcy and people don't know. But a lot of those stores on their uh, 
plots that they own, like Macy's owns theirs, uh, Dillard's owns those, so Pete owns theirs. So people that are in those malls, they have a decision to make on whether they want to renew the lease or let it go. But if you go to Independence Mall, there's only one vacant a pod in there, and that's yeah. uh, one of the shoe stores just moved out. So malls are still hanging in there in this area, as long as you've got good quality stores in there, people are going. Real quick, Nick, the new owners of the Kansas City Plaza are not Highwoods property minded. Right. They do not care about the high end stores necessarily being in there like uh, Highwoods did. Halls moved out, Talbots moved out, and they put a hamburger store in there. A nice hamburger store, but it's a hamburger store. Could the next Kansas governor be a dog? It's a story making national news this week. How Angus the dog filed the paperwork to create a candidate committee so he can run for Kansas governor, or at least Angus's adult companion in Hutchinson did. He was empowered by the news that six teenagers who can't even vote are running for the state's highest office. So if there are no qualifications for who can run for governor, why not his pooch then, Steve? Well, the pooch uh, can't run. They, they, uh, Secretary of State Collier, uh, uh, Kobach has taken the pooch uh, off any prospect for a ballot. You know, it's so frustrating for a guy who covers politics for a living. We write about all these serious issues and we stomp our, our feet over one injustice or another. But it's the pooch story that takes the cake when it comes to national attention and national publicity here. But the broader question here, Nick, is who should be allowed to run for Kansas governor and who shouldn't be? Lots of high schoolers, as, as you yes. know, are now running for governor. And there's a great, uh, there's a debate in, in Kansas right now as to whether that's a appropriate or not. Yeah, and even those teenagers are also getting as much national attention as the pooch, Angus, uh, but they're also being squeezed out. There is a bill in the Kansas legislature to prevent uh, anyone under the age of 18 now from running for office, uh, for governor that is. And, and secondly, the, the officially sanctioned debates by the Republican Party don't even include those teenagers. Right. Well, let's take up the debate in a minute, but I do think there, uh, one of the things that has been accomplished is that the legislature is going to review some of these rules. There was a, a story this week that a seventh teenager from Pennsylvania is thinking about running for Kansas governor <laughs> to point out the need for a residency requirement. So a review of all of that will be important. It, it's likely that whatever passes this year, though, won't take effect until the next election cycle uh, because these teenagers feel like they have a right to sign up. The debate is another question. The Republicans have done everything they can to make this debate not really a debate, but something they can sort of stay for the favored candidates, and that's why the kids are cut out. Eric. Does it kind of seem like it makes a mockery of the, the political system if you're going to throw a dog in the race and go through that that much work to yeah. go ahead Do you see British elections? They have like people like Screaming Lord Such and people like dressed as Star Wars characters <laughs> running yeah. as candidates for major political yeah. races against Theresa May in her local constituency. But it seems like this is a sacred thing, the importance of the vote, the importance of the political process, and then you have a dog and you have, not saying that a teenager can't do the job better than some of the people that we have there, <laughs> but it still kind of seems like it yeah, makes some mockery Sometimes you need this absurdity system. to force people right. to do something, and that's right. what this has been all well, about. Well, the argument in right. Kansas is that it's becoming too messy, it's unwieldy to have anyone run for office. Is the same argument being used now in Missouri about all those people who file those initiative questions you see on your ballot? You've seen them collecting signatures outside mm -hmm. your local grocery store. Missouri Secretary of State Jay Ashcroft says it's gotten out of hand. Ten years ago, 15 initi initiative petitions were filed with his office. This year, that number has skyrocketed to 330. He's now proposing a $500 fee to file a petition. And on top of that, he wants to collect a 40 cents per signature fee to defray the administrative costs of verifying signatures. That charge, though, would only apply if the people collecting the signatures were being paid. Is this a reasonable approach to streamlining what has now become an overwhelmingly popular process, Mark? I think something has to be done. I think the $500 fee is reasonable. If you have a cause that that's worthy, surely you can come up with the $500 to keep the numbskulls out of it. But uh, I think the 40 cent per signature verification is too much. You're talking like $65,000 to get something on the but ballot. But some of these big organizations that run these campaigns have millions of dollars that they're, they're waging on right. these and paying but people But I do disagree it. with my friend and colleague Mark Alford. I think the $500 uh, fee is abominable because it would mean that you would have to meet a an expense threshold to 
access a petition process that should be open to all voters. It shouldn't be just for rich people. It should be for all people. In fact, that's why you even have a petition process. We've talked but about that on the But haven't you expressed concerns board. on this very program, though, about the city level? Right. There, there are too right. many initiatives. Now, how, it takes about 1,500 signatures in Kansas City. Statewide in Missouri, it takes about 110,000. So the barrier to getting on the ballot is high, and it takes real work to get on the ballot. That should be sufficient to, uh, to go before voters in the state. Alrighty, a Facebook video from two women who claimed they were being racially profiled at an Applebee's restaurant in Independence has now gone viral and been watched more than two million times. No wonder it's a story now making the national news networks. So she's positive that she's seen us. We haven't been there. An hour into their meal, Alexis Bryson and her friend say they were approached by a police officer, an Applebee's manager, and a mall security guard. That's when they were accused of dining and dashing a day before. We have not been here. Backlash on social media was swift, and Applebee's launched its own investigation. Days later, Applebee says the franchise terminated the manager, server, and another employee involved in the incident. Now that restaurant has been shut down for good. So why does the story continue to attract attention? Is it because of Applebee's dramatic response or is it because people are upset about how the police seem to be taking sides when there appear to be no evidence the women had done anything wrong, Eric? I think it's both. And I think that even though Applebee terminated the people, I think one of the major problems is there's been no public apology for it. The police, the Still. police officers that was there uh, <laughs> never reprimanded, never apologized. He just went with what the waitress and the manager said without examining the facts. And he kind of uh, kind of edged it on a little bit by some of his comments. But I think it's a combination of both. Now, the Independence Police Department has now said, yes, they are looking into it, though, right. Mark. Yeah, they are. And uh, I think eventually they'll have to come across with some sort of response. It's a very sad situation for Independence Mall, which is already in foreclosure. Uh, we don't know if they're going to get a new buyer. Applebee's has now closed that store. The signs are all gone. We reported that this morning. Um, so they were pretty much going to be on their way out anyway. I think this was an avenue for Applebee's to save as much face as they can in a really bad situation with no winners. Is there too much second guessing, though, of the police, even though we don't always know all of the facts going on? Or is this scrutiny appropriate? Area police certainly coming under fire a lot lately in our metro. Just a couple of weeks ago, it was ire against an Overland Park police officer who shot and killed a high school student as he was driving out of his garage. And this week, Mayor Sly James lashes out at police officials for wanting more money to hire more officers. I hate to tell you, but 76 percent of that budget goes to public safety recognize that this city has a whole lot of other things that have to be done and the budget that we're going to offer is the best that we can do. I kind of get tired of this banging on the city crap. Police not feeling much love right now, Steve? Well, it, police deserve as much scrutiny as the public can can give police. I think, you know, they have a really hard job, no question about it, but scrutiny is a good thing. Transparency, sunlight, all good things. I think Mayor James made a very good point there. Nick, I want to underscore a point he just said. 76% of the city budget goes to police and fire, public security. That's a huge number. The mayor simply saying, we can't do a whole lot more. The police are going to have to make do with what they get right now. That's a valid point. But doesn't Kansas City have fewer police officers relative to its population policing the streets as other peer cities, Eric? And asking for more officers, isn't that what the public wants? Well, it depends on what part of the city you're in. Some people want less officers in their neighborhoods. Some people want more. But I think it's a valid point. But where do you cut off 76% uh, of your budget is in law enforcement and the fire department. What about the streets? What about the other things that need to be done in the city? I think I think it is as a valid point. And one other thing, people in the black community are talking about, do we have a chief of police? Because nobody's seen him. You see uh, Rosalind Temple, uh, mother's in charge, you see her more than you do the chief of police when there's an incident. Well, he's been on Weekend Review on Ruckus, and I just bumped into him at Trader Joe's, Mark, so he has been seen. <laughs> in fact, he's going to be on my podcast tonight. I'm interviewing him for an hour today uh, for my podcast. But 
Uh, he does not have the vis visibility that Daryl Forte had. Daryl Forte was out in the community. Well, when you come again after Daryl Forte, it's That's kind tough. of a hard act to follow. I mean, he was every uh, murder scene. He still goes out to murder mm -hmm. scenes and talks with families. He doesn't want to get in the way of Chief Smith, but he is trying to help how he can. That's a tough act to follow. But, but back to the broader question about the number of police officers. Isn't that really what the public wants when we're seeing these national stories that has Kansas City on the top ten list right. of the most violent cities in America? Well, well of course, Nick. And, and but the uh, state statutes require the city of Kansas City to spend twenty percent of its general fund on the police. It spends more than double that. Mm -hmm. If the police are not able to put more officers on the streets, it's because the department is being mismanaged and they have been handed report after report after report of ways to save money by cutting uh, activities that are superfluous and using that money to put officers on the street. They choose not to do so. They choose to hand uh, raises to their officers to match the fire service. Uh, they are not exempt. The police department should not be exempt uh, from uh, watching every penny, just like every other governmental agent. Speaking of stories, by the way, that go viral, like the Applebee's story, why is the story of this man attracting so much attention when thousands of longtime residents of the United States are deported each year for overstaying their visas? This is Syed Jamal in the Lawrence, he's the Lawrence scientist teaching at Park University. He was arrested by immigration agents as authorities prepared <coughs> to deport him back to Bangladesh. Why so much attention on this specific case? Steve? Well, he's a an incredibly sympathetic figure, Nick. Uh, he's an older man with kids, uh, a good citizen in the community who has done uh, good works uh, where he's lived. And I think that profile has simply captured, he's become the face of a, of a very contentious, difficult issue in the country, Nick. And that's what's galvanized people and grabbed attention here. In the last yeah. month of the Obama administration, there were more than 2,000 deportation proceedings against residents in this country had overstayed uh, their visas. But we've never heard in, in, in the local news as much attention as it is on no, this There man. was a case a couple of years ago, a woman who was deported. I can't remember her name, but you know, the media, that's the media's job, especially in television. You find the sympathetic character and you try to attach emotion to the story, right, Dave? Uh, you give the facts, but this is an emotional story. This guy has uh, two uh, children who are citizens and um, it's a sympathetic story. Why, why is it that Emmanuel Kleber is also the main front man for this on the political level when this is a Lawrence-based scientist, that is, that's Lynn Jenkins' district. He teaches at Park University, which is in Sam Graves' district, and he was in a uh, Platt City, uh, Platt County jail, which is also in the 6th district, not part of Emmanuel Kleber's district at all. And uh, Emmanuel Kleber would have to give you the answer to that, but I kind of go along with what Steve said. He's a good figure. He's a good issue to be on the right side of immigration with. When you hear about immigration, regardless of an expired visa or not, you hear, you see the bad guys, you hear about the people that are committing crimes, but you don't hear about the type of people that this gentleman is and right here. I don't hear a lot about his case uh, in particular, the facts of it. He overstayed his right. visa, we know Twice. that twice. Yeah. Uh, the judge ordered his deportation, but we don't have any reason why the judge ordered that or why he overstayed his, his uh, visas. President Trump is getting some backlash for his plans to host a military parade on the 4th of July through the streets of Washington. Now Missouri Attorney General Josh Hawley is offering up Missouri as the venue for the big time parade. Are Missouri cities like Kansas City now competing to win the parade and all the economic boosts the city would attract for hosting such an event, Steve? Well, I don't know if Kansas City is competing for it, Nick, but certainly Josh Hawley, who's a candidate for the U.S. Senate in Missouri, says, hey, St. Louis or Kansas City would be a terrific venue for a military parade. He got on Twitter this week and asked the president to bring the parade out here. I talked to his campaign this week and the Holly campaign says the Country Club Plaza would be a terrific venue for a national <laughs> military parade. I don't know about that. Now, but. Josh Hawley running against Claire McCaskill for the United States Senate seat in Missouri right. later this year. Um, Assuming the he's fact, the nominee. Exactly, if he right. is. But, but the fact, though, that he is m hitching his wagon to Trump, <laughs> does that suggest that uh, Donald Trump is actually doing much better in Missouri than some people would have you believe? The polling is a little mixed. There are polls that suggest he is still relatively popular in Missouri. Uh, but as we've pointed out on this show before, Nick, when he was winning Missouri by 19 points in 2016, Trump, 
Uh, Roy Blunt, the incumbent, was only beating uh, Jason Kander by three points. So Senate races might be a little bit different. But uh, Josh ought to get over to Kansas City because putting that parade on the Country Club Plaza <laughs> is probably not the wisest idea. We just had a big parade for some baseball players mm. that went down Grand. And Grand is wide, and you could put tanks on Grand. It's going to be a little different to put a tank next to the Classic Cup. And so the plaza probably isn't the best venue for I'll stick with Tank 7. Yeah. Right. <laughs> That's right. Right. A changing of the guard in education, that is. This week, UMKC gets a brand new chancellor, and the Metro's second largest school district, Shawnee Mission, picks a new leader. I truly look forward to a long and fruitful partnership as we work to create the great university that Kansas City needs and deserves. I want to thank the Shawnee Mission Board of Education for the opportunity to serve as superintendent. So what do we learn from these choices this week? And if you don't attend UMKC or a Shawnee Mission School, why should you care, Steve Kraske? Well, these are two very important education leaders in the community, Nick, and everyone should hope for their success because uh, that needs to happen. I think we get a, a very clear picture of what the Shawnee Mission uh, this new superintendent wants to do. He wants to be the anti-Jim Henson, the former superintendent who uh, left under uh, very unpopular with a lot of people for his dictatorial tendencies. Other folks said he got a lot of stuff done, but this new superintendent clearly wants to be a collaborator, work with teachers to get things done what together. What does the new head of UMKC tell us in that specific pick? What well, they thought the interim uh, chancellor was going to get that position. And did not, be, but the whoever holds that seat faces enormous challenges. UMKC and the entire University of Missouri system is under budget pressure. There are cutbacks, faculty uh, changes. That's an important job, an important uh, institution in the community and to a certain degree the Shawnee Mission superintendent faces a similar challenge shrinking resources changing demographics both of them have their work cut out for them. and that is our week in review our thanks to our news reviewers getting up in the morning before anyone should be reasonably expected to do so Fox Morning News anchor Mark Alford and from your Kansas City star Dave Helling keeping you up to date weekday mornings at 11 on KCUR Steve Kraske and on call at the call Eric Wesson. I'm Nick Haynes from all of us at KCPT. Thanks for spending part of your weekend with us.